Hello folks and welcome to Lecture 5 in 1976. It's been uh, 16 years since we've had a presidential debate. Not for lack of trying, but a lot of factors go into making a presidential debate happen. As we saw in 1960, the Congress of the United States had to grant an exemption to Section 315 of the 1934 Telecommunications Act, which said that equal time was not going to be enforced to have the debates of 1960. If it had been, NBC, CBS, and ABC would have had to have given hours of airtime to the 40 or so presidential candidates who are running from every little party all over the place. There's not a viability clause in that. It's, it's your official candidate. You get equal time. In the last couple of elections, there was no interest in having debates from much of the candidates at all. The only one being Herbert Humphrey who wanted to have debates quite a bit when he was trying to run for president and uh, did not get any um, purchase or interest from Richard Nixon's campaign. Even though Nixon had done the 1960s debates, I think it left a bad taste in his mouth that he didn't really want to do televised debates after his experience in 1960. And, uh, you know, who could blame him? Uh, it's kind of the Wild West out there when it comes to presidential debates. And um, also, both of these candidates... LBJ and Nixon get off the hook because there was no appetite in Congress for going through a huge suspension of the rules like that again. But in 1976, Gerald Ford, who was the Republican nominee for president and the sitting president, he didn't have a mandate. He hadn't been elected. And uh, he wanted to be reelected president. So he came out at a press conference right after being nominated and challenged Democratic candidate Jimmy Carter to a series of debates. He said he would meet him in a series of debates, and since it's the birthday of the country, 1976, the bicentennial is a great way to reinforce America's tradition in debate and discussion. Mm -hmm. Ford's challenge was taken up pretty eagerly by Carter and Carter's uh, campaign, because Jimmy Carter, although well-known in Georgia and known in the South and known to Democratic insiders, didn't really have a national profile yet and loved the idea of sharing the podium with the president to take their case directly to the American people. So both sides were in a unique position to want to debate. And since the challenge came from an incumbent to debate, this is very unusual. Only an incumbent who has a lot of points down in the polls would want to do something like that. So how are we going to get these debates if Congress won't suspend Section 315? Luckily, uh, there are exemptions to Section 315. Uh, if you're covering a news event involving politics... If you are uh, covering somebody else's political event, you could, you know, cover a Democratic, a series of Democratic candidates talking about an issue that a, a local uh, organization held. You could cover that. Hmm. Well, why not go to the organization that's been hosting debates since 1928, the League of Women Voters? Both parties approach the League of Women Voters and the major broadcast networks and say, hey, you know, why don't you guys, you host the debates? And then the networks can cover it as a bona fide news event, and that would eliminate the legal challenge to us to provide equal time. The networks were into it. The campaigns were into it. The League of Women Voters was very concerned, though, because hosting the debates might expose them to legal liability. There was a lot of talk of collusion, and the talk of collusion continues through the time that the League of Women Voters hosts the presidential debates. Keep in mind that they were approached by the parties to host the debates. They tried to do the best job they could, but they had the major networks on one side pushing on them for demands and the two political parties pushing on them for demands. So it's not as if the campaign, uh, the leaders of the campaigns were excited uh, to uh, do what the League of Women Voters wants them to do. Um, one of the more interesting things about this is how much the campaigns are still in charge. They were in charge when the networks were covering 1960. They're still in charge in 1976 because they're like, hey, without us, you can't really have a debate, can you? And the League of Women Voters are kind of like, well, we've, we put a lot of money and time into this. Uh, I guess we kind of need to do what they want. And the networks, too. The networks are covering the event. Lots of other campaigns sue the League of Women Voters sue the campaigns, make FCC challenges, but the FCC determines that there is no equal time uh, required provision here. The FCC believes it's a bona fide news event. It's being covered by the networks, so they deny all these uh, charges and the debates go on. There was a lot of talk of conspiracy in these debates. Part of it was because the League of Women Voters wanted to run a very professional event. Here, well, here's one of the big charges that happened is the League of Women Voters didn't allow 
other news organizations to bring their cameras into the debate. They said, just pool cameras. We'll have one camera and all the networks can draw on the same shot. Okay, so ABC provided the technical gear. CBS and NBC would draw on the pool camera shot. Now, if this is a legitimate news event, why are these organizations not allowed to bring their cameras in? Critics argued. Hmm, sounds like collusion to me. These seem like Democrat and Republican hosted debates to try to keep other candidates, other people out of the debates and just make it appear to be a two-party race. Uh, that's to the benefit of those two large parties. The second issue for collusion was that it was learned a list of journalists was prepared by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party and submitted to the League of Women Voters, who then made a list of 15 journalists to serve on the panel from both lists that then the parties could agree to. Uh, instead of just inviting their own moderators, inviting their own uh, journalists and saying, tough, this is how it goes. But again, this is the parties being in charge, something that's not going to go away and is still with us in the uh, CPD era or the Commission on Presidential Debates era of hosting these debates. So the League of Women Voters really felt under pressure and under the gun and the legitimacy of this as a political debate being covered by the media was under question for that too. So the debates go on. As for interesting things that happened, well, this happened right before the closing statements of debate number one. Governor Carter. Well, one of the very serious things that's happened in our government in recent years and has continued uh, up until now is a breakdown in the trust among our people and the Broadcasters from Philadelphia have temporarily lost the audio. It is not a conspiracy against Governor Carter or President Ford, and they will fix it as soon as possible. The audio was out for a good 22 minutes, where the candidates just kind of stood there, didn't talk to each other, and the debate didn't go on, which was fuel for the fire of this conspiracy theory that this was a debate meant for television. This was a broadcast debate. It wasn't a debate that was happening in a civic center that was being covered by the media. No, this was for the media. Why did they stop debating when the sound went out? If it wasn't, if it wasn't just for television, or if television wasn't the intended audience. This threw a wrench into arguments that the media is just covering the debate, not hosting. The debate, which was uh, part of a later FCC challenge that also was denied. I can't hear them either, so I don't know what it is we're not hearing. I think they have stopped because they have been told the uh, sound has been lost. I think they've stopped talking. Uh, whatever happened, we hope to have it fixed shortly. I wish I could tell you more about it, but that's all I know. They tried to cover it up. You hear the anchor talking there about um, some of the uh, the issues that they're facing there in a live uh, TV broadcast. But uh, a single compass capacitor in a line uh, failed, and uh, they had to go and check the entire line of uh, the microphone cable out to the uh, broadcast truck to figure out which, which of the things had failed. So it was really just a technical question. However, it had been a debate for the Philadelphia audience and other media were covering it, then this might not have been a problem. The second reason this debate is extremely famous is the invention of what's called the gaffe. Now, the gaffe is a uh, slang term that we talk about in presidential debates for when candidates uh, really make a big mistake, either with facts or they say something patently untrue or they make a huge mistake with delivery. Uh, this is Gerald Ford inventing the presidential gaffe when he's asked a question about whether or not he thinks that the Soviet Union is going to hold up their end of the bargain with the Helsinki Accords, which had been recently negotiated. I'm glad you raised it, Mr. Uh, Franco. In the case of Helsinki, 35 nations signed an agreement, including the Secretary of State, or the Vatican, I can't under any circumstances believe that the His Holiness the Pope would agree by signing that agreement 
that the 35 nations have turned over to the Warsaw Pact nations the domination of uh, Eastern Europe. It just isn't true. And if Mr. Carter alleges that His Holiness, by signing that, has done it, he is totally inaccurate. Now, what has been accomplished by the Helsinki Agreement? Number one, we have an agreement where they notify us and we notify them of any uh, military maneuvers that are to be undertaken. They have done it in both cases where they've done so. There is no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, and there never will be under a Ford administration. Uh, I, I'm sorry, could I just follow? Did I understand you to say, sir, that the Russians are not using Eastern Europe as their own sphere of influence and occupying mo most of the countries there and, and, and making sure with their troops that it's, a, that it's a communist zone, whereas on our side of the line, the Italians and the French are still flirting with... I don't believe, uh, Mr. Frankel, that uh, the Yugoslavians consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. I don't believe that the Romanians consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. I don't believe that the Poles consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. Each of those countries is independent, autonomous. It has its own territorial integrity. And the United States does not concede that those countries are under the domination of the Soviet Union. As a matter of fact, I visited Poland, uh, Yugoslavia, and Romania to make certain that the people of those countries understood that the President of the United States and the people of the United States are dedicated to their independence, their autonomy, and their freedom. Now you can see the journalist really uh, about to laugh there saying you really don't think that uh, Eastern Europe's under Soviet domination? And this clip, the clip of Ford saying that he thinks these are independent countries, circulates in the media as if he doesn't think that the Iron Curtain exists. But in the clip I just showed you, you can see that the gaffe is somewhat, um, it's not really something Ford is doing, it's something that's kind of constructed out of what he's saying. He just misspoke. He says that the United States is committed to the idea of an independent Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Poland. Uh, he thinks these countries have a legitimate desire to be independent and treated independently, and that the U.S. government will treat them as independent nations to show that they support their, their freedom. Uh, it gets turned around the way the debate question comes out uh, in the way that he just doesn't think that the Iron Curtain exists. The 1976 debates are... They generate even more scholarly and research and media attention than the 1960 debates do. Unfortunately, uh, we don't really get a permanent exemption from Section 315 because of it. The League of Women Voters hosted a great event, according to everybody. The networks were happy. The two parties are definitely happy. And um, things are going to continue. But the one thing that's hanging out in the background here that I think is most interesting is this idea of television. The technology that Adelaide Stevenson thought would bring us all together and create a great democratic discussion actually hampered discussion with the 20-minute audio gap in debate number one. The technical failure really brought to the forefront that this wasn't traditional debate. This was debate that was going to have its own technical uh, errors, its own kind of things it's beholden to, and it's going to look kind of odd when those things fail. So in the background of the mind here, I, I want you to think... How is television influencing what debate can be? How is television influencing the rules and the nature of debate here? In the next debate series in 1980, we're going to meet the person who really figures it out and masters the presidential debate because he's a master of speaking to the camera.